of the Holy Spirit be with you this day. It is on behalf of the Coleman family and the Sycamore View Church of Christ that we welcome you 
to this homegoing of James Edward Coleman, Jr. We're here to celebrate a life well lived. We are here to enter this sacred space where God meets us, better yet, where we meet God in our sadness and in our celebration, in our grief and in our joy as we reflect on the life and legacy of our dear departed brother. We meet God as he continues carrying us along this process. We must attend. I'll draw your attention uh, to the program in the order of service. We'll have the praise team sing I Am Redeemed, the solo by Julie Sano. We'll have a scripture reading by Glenn McClain, a resolution from Chaplain Davis of the Shelby County Sheriff's Office and then we'll have another selection by the praise team, How Great Thou Art. We will stick uh, to that program, and the next voice you will hear will be the praise team with Julie Sano.
family wants to take this time to thank you for truly being here, looking at the size and magnitude of this audience. Jimmy has touched many lives. You all may know the professional and business side of Jimmy, but the family knows a different side, the comical Jimmy. See, if Jimmy was here, we'd be getting a call next week. Did you see Miss what you call her with her head on sideways? <laughs> we get that call, and that means even as difficult and hard as this is, we can still smile and laugh. There are many young men that are here in this room that have been touched by his gift of encouragement that tells you, despite the circumstances, do not let that direct your path, and you know who you are. Liz, you've been a rock. Tisha, you've been a soldier, and we thank you for that. I know this is difficult for Dwight and Constance and Tara, for Jimmy, or for Liz, and for Letitia. But Jimmy accepted the will of God. He'd made peace with God. And for that, there is rejoicing. Death is going to come to all of us. The key is, be ready. And that we can cherish. So we're left with memories. And if Jimmy was here, he would say, you all, this is difficult. But we can get through this. Let's hang on to our memories. And I'm thankful as a, as a brother-in-law that God has allowed my path and our paths to cross because nothing happens by circumstance. Again, we thank you. Our scripture text is taken from Psalms 121. Psalms 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall never slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from the time forth and even forevermore. Shall we bow in prayer? Our God and Father above, Father, we are thankful that you allowed our eyes to open on this day. For it is you, Father, that got us up this morning, you, God, that have gathered us here for this memorial. We are thankful, Father, for all that you've done for us throughout the course of our lives. Once again, Father, you have allowed this family to come together. And we pray, Father, that you will continue to watch over Liz and Letitia. We know, Father, that the tears will not stop and end on this day. And God, I pray that you will be with them tomorrow next week, next month, and for years to come. Father, continue to be with Dwight and Constance Tar in the loss of their brother. There are many, God, that are here that have lost a husband, a father, a brother, a cousin, and so on. And we know, God, that you are able to help through these times. There are many, Father, that you have sent comfort, but we realize and know that only true comfort lies within you. We have a father, we have a, a, a father that have given us Christ, a savior, who knows the pain of loss, who also was the greatest comforter. And may we continue, Father, to thank you for him. So thankful, God, for the memories and the life that, that Jimmy has lived, and we'll pray, God, that we will continue to hold on to those memories. Father, we are so thankful for the many that have touched this family, this congregation, that have extended their hearts and their love during this time. We pray, God, that you will bless them. Father, when this day ends, we pray, God, that we will find ourselves right with you. That when our eyes close today, Father, we can have also that peace knowing, Father, that we are right 
in your sight. So thankful, Father, for all that you do for us. May we not take one another for granted, Father, but take every day as occasion, Father, for our lives to be right. Continue to watch over us and bless us. Thankful most of all, Father, for Christ, your Son, and our Savior, who suffered a great loss, but for us a great gain. And may we continue to lift that name of Christ above all names. For we ask this prayer. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Josh Ross, the presider, and to each of you who've come for this homegrown celebration for James Edward Coleman Jr. We are here because he's been such a part of our family for so many years and we are here to express our love and our support and Sheriff Bill Odom extends his condolences and continuous prayers on behalf of this family. Also a proclamation prepared in his office. I'm going to ask all of those from Correction no matter what agency you're from, and also those from the Sheriff County government to stand and remain standing as we read this resolution. <clears throat> Thank you. It says, Sheriff's Office, County of Shelby, State of Tennessee, recognition by the Sheriff. With our Bill Odom, Sheriff of Shelby County, take this moment to honor the memory and the life of James Edward Jr. Coleman, who has been returned to the welcoming arms of God. Whereas we as family, friends, colleagues, and acquaintances are gathered here today to mourn not only the loss of his loving and physical presence, but also to rejoice and to recall the many momentous and joyful occasions in his life. Whereas Director Coleman began his career with the Sheba County Sheriff's Office in November 2001 as Assistant Jail Director, and in 2004 he was appointed as Director the Sheriff County Jail by then Mark Lockyer Jr. as Sheriff. <clears throat> Whereas Director James Coleman went to be with the Lord on Sunday, November the 1st, 2015. He leaves his wife Liz, his son Maurice, his daughter Patricia, his brother Dwight, sisters Constant and Tara, and many other family members and friends to cherish his memory and legacy as they are here today in remembrance of him. We pray and ask the Lord to give them peace in their hearts today. Let them be comforted in knowing they will all be together again soon. As written according to the Holy Scripture that says, Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. John 8, 51 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, If a man keep my sin, he shall never see death. Now, therefore, be resolved that James Edward Coleman, Jr., a man with a heart of gold, be praised in life celebrated and remembered on this day of his interment, Saturday, March 7th, 2015. In witness whereof I have been to set my hand and call the seal of the Sheriff County Sheriff's Office to be affixed on the 7th day of March, 2015, Signed, Bill Odom, Sheriff of Sheriff County. Thank you, God bless you. Liz, we love you guys. You may be seated.
sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul. still and know that I am God. Liz, this is the passage from the 46th Psalm that I thought of immediately when you called me Tuesday night and gave me three minutes. <laughs> I did my usual walk in the mall Wednesday. I didn't see you there, but uh, it was there that, uh, that I put together what I have to say. And I was absolutely sure that I could take it, say it without having to read it. But uh, wow, you, uh, 
you surprised me with all of this. This is just so beautiful. Then you ask for a message of comfort. Please be comforted in the knowledge that the comforter is with you always. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah, I, yes, I am the one who comforts you. John tells us that Jesus said, but the comforter who is the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things into your remembrance. You're in good hands, Liz. When you accepted Christ as your Savior, you received the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. A couple of months ago, I saw a black pickup, and on the back, in the back window, there was a sign, but it was just the letters on the, on the rear window. And in bold, capital letters, it said, God. And next to it, in lowercase letters, it said, is. Now, that struck me. We regularly talk about the great I am. We know that there is no past tense for God. There is no future tense for God. He says, I am the great I am. For me, that means God is. Now, how about this, Liz? Jimmy is. When he slipped from your arms, he entered into the arms of God, the eternal God, the great I am. Jimmy has entered into eternity. For him, time is no more. As a servant of God, a servant who is a member of the family of God, Jimmy has his royal robes and he has a crown full of beautiful jewels. He's in the presence of God. He is in the mansion the Lord went to prepare for him. He is in the presence of the Holy Trinity. He is there with Moses and Elijah as they talk to Jesus. He's listening in and participating in that conversation. Don't you know he loves that conversation? I have said that Jim Coleman is a giant of a man, but this is much bigger than I thought. Brothers and sisters, Sister Liz, Sister Leticia, Sawyer, Maurice, friends of Jim Coleman, fellow laborers, that's you, Sheriff's Department. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate it very much. I have used the name Jimmy for our beloved Jim Coleman because you, Sister Liz, always use that name. To the Lord, he is good and faithful servant. Brothers and sisters, be of good cheer. Liz's Jimmy is in the presence of God forever. May we all experience the same fate, for Jimmy is. I know everybody's wondering uh, where the sun came from. <laughs> uh, I am that son that was uh, born in 01, the summer of 01. Uh, Jimmy has been a father uh, to me. He uh, had the algorithm for success. He uh, had God, family, friends, and community. And he taught me in that way. Um, 
I met Jimmy with my, um, my wife and Ms. Liz were shopping as usual. And uh, they met each other. And they started talking about their husbands. So uh, Ms. Liz told my wife that Jimmy was a, golf, a golf, golfer and a, a fisher, fisherman. So they hooked us up to fish together at the lake at my house. So my wife told me the day of, the day before, so, oh, you're supposed to fish with a guy that I met. I met his wife. I was like, I was like, really? On Saturday morning? She was like, yeah. I was like, man. So he called me in, in Jimmy's tone. How you doing? Jimmy called me. Coming to fish with you in the morning. I'll be there at about 5.30. We have to get on the boat at 6 o'clock in order to catch good fish. And I'll see you in the morning. I was like, oh, my God. So I looked right at my wife. I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> but that, that day, I think I caught more fish that day than I have since we've been living on that lake. And from that instance on, that was my, my dad. He has taught me a whole lot, a whole lot. The best thing about Jimmy was he was humble. And if he made a mistake, I didn't have to ask anybody about it. He would come to me and say, Mo, I did this, and you don't make the same thing. You don't do the same thing I did. He would look at me and say, you're a mini me. You remind me so much of, of when I was younger. And he just taught me. And those golf games that we played, he's the one that introduced me to golf. It wasn't the golf. It was those conversations that we had on the golf course, in the car, going to the golf course. He, he changed a lot of our lives. A lot of the golfers are here now that uh, we played with. They're all sitting back there. Uh, would y'all stand for me, please? <laughs> and he introduced me to the golfers in Nashville. I would go to the doubles tournament in Nashville. And those guys reminded me so much of Jimmy. It was just like a family. Every time we would go down, they would invite us in with open arms. But for Jimmy, I'm not, he's, he can't, it's just three minutes, so for Jimmy, his, one of his Jimmy-isms, as the golfers call it, when we were on the tee box, he would say sometimes, I would bomb one down the fairway, and he would come behind me, and he would be shorter, and he would look at me and say, it ain't far, but it's fair. <laughs> And what that meant to me was he was about to do something good on that hole because he was trying to get in my head. <laughs> so on that, on that hole, he would normally, when he said that, would normally par a birdie. And when he would par a birdie, he will look at me and say, now I'm in the conversation. <laughs> well, Jimmy will always be in the conversation for me. He has a lifelong hold on me and my family and the people that are around him. I've met so many people through him, because of him, and I'm greatly honored for him to be my father. God bless you all, and thank you. Good afternoon. I had in my mind to say a lot about Cole. That's what I've always called him. But it was too many law officers stood up, so I had to got to change my mind. <laughs> so, but anyway, Coleman was, was a dear friend of mine, a dear friend of mine. He and his wife have spent the weekend at my home. My wife and I have spent days and weekends at their home. And let me tell you, Liz is a great cook. <laughs> and it was just a shock, a total shock, when Liz told me that he had passed on. 
But after thinking about it, I thought of my grandfather, which was a preacher, and he used to say to me all the time that you live and then you die. It is what you do in between living and dying that counts. And Coleman did a lot, as evident by the people that are present here today. He's a great man, a great guy, had a great mind. We talked a lot on the phone, as did Liz and I. Uh, Coleman was a fixer. He always knew what to do. Liz and myself, we are politicians. <laughs> we talk politics. But anyway, uh, I sit and listen to the ones that come before me. Uh, Coleman loved God. He's past president of the <coughs> Nashville Duffers Golf Association. Love God, as do I. And I got to thinking. Golf is a lot like life. And I thought of a rule in golf that allows one to play in inclement weather. When it's raining, when the course is wet, that rule is called lift, clean it, and place the ball. It allows you, once you hit the golf ball and it lands in the mud, that rule allows the player to lift his ball, clean it, and then place it back to where you picked it up from. Life is a lot like that. In life, we have to lift ourselves up, clean our souls, clean ourselves, and then place ourselves in God's hand. That is it. That is life. To Liz, Tisha, you've lost a great husband, great father, but don't worry about it. God will replace it. In Proverbs 3 verse 5 it states trust in God with all thine heart and lean not unto your own understanding. That's what the two of you do for as long as you breathe. And my wife and I will always, for as long as we live, be your friend. Call on us. still remain in my mind and my heart forever. I've known Jim 40 years now. Liz, Letitia, when you're feeling a little bit down, remember this song. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on. Let me stand, Lord, I'm tired, I am weak, I'm worn through the 
word from 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 5. For we know that if this earthly house, this tabernacle we live in, is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not made by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan in our burden, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God who has given us the Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. If I could just be swallowed up by life. Liz, Tisha, family, friends, and my brothers and sisters in Christ, just a few brief words of comfort for the family. My name's Eric Wilson, I'm one of the ministers here, and I'm one of those honored to uh, be mentored and cared for and guided and inspired by Jim. Josh and I had just left a, a funeral last Sunday in Millington. We had gotten back and uh, had a group of people coming over to the house and as they were gathering in, Josh called me again and I, I picked up the phone and he didn't sound right. I, I said, Josh, what's up? And he said, Eric, I got bad news for you. Jim has passed. It, I, I was numb. 
the, the edge of the bed didn't seem like it could bear up under the weight of my grief and I just fell down and, and I sat there in, in that grief and the, the question that naturally just came up was, Josh, what, what happened? So I had to tell uh, my family and friends that were gathered there for our discipleship time. I gathered all of the adults together and I said, y'all, Jim has passed and the natural question that came up well, was, what happened? Was it the transplant? He, he, he was just mentioning how, how good he felt. What, was it something the physicians did not catch? Was it something I didn't see? What happened to Jim? Isn't that the question we ask? You know, I, I've done my fair share of... Um, pastoral counseling and, and crisis counseling. I've been at uh, many people's uh, deathbeds and bedsides, and I, I, I've spent a lot of time walking alongside people in the midst of grief, and what I've discovered is even when you do find out the answer, it never seems to satisfy. When the doctor says it, it's cancer or, or it was a reaction to some medicine or it was just old age settling in, none of these earthly answers seem really to make much sense or even matter at the time or provide the necessary satisfaction that we seek. Once I find out it just seems just as hollow, the grief seems just as deep, the sadness seems just as unrelenting. Then God. Then God, as he so often does, brings some scripture to bear. And I couldn't remember the passage succinctly, but then the words came flooding off of the page and gives me the answer to the what happened question. And it was an answer that not only brought me comfort, but excited my soul. What happened to Jim? He was swallowed up by life. He was not consumed by unrelenting darkness. He was not seized by the clutches of some void. Jim was not subsumed by death, encompassed by dying, or even enveloped in the grave. Scriptural witness tells me, it tells us, it tells you, Jim was swallowed up by life. The full measure of being itself, the sum total of consciousness, the total totality of vitality, that which enlivens, engages, and energizes, all of it came at the behest, at the command of almighty and gracious God, and in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, Jim was swallowed up. My life have scripture tell it it seems as if those who die in the Lord are more alive than we are it seems as if his spirit is more alive than mine is at this point oh to be swallowed up by life to have life come and get me to have the Zoe fail, the, the life that really is life, just to come from the throne room of God, cutting through time and space and come and get me. Y'all, I love you, but I'm waiting for him to come get me. What does Paul say? To live is Christ, but to die is gain. I, I want some of that. I want to be swallowed up by life. See, there's so much that gets in the way between my relationship, between me and my God, my short-sightedness, my selfishness, my, my doubts, the, the failures of my past, the fears of my present, and the anxieties that I have about the future, and this flesh, this, this doggone flesh, this, this lusting and fragile and disappointing flesh. There is so much that gets in the way of me and my relationship with God all but to be swallowed up by life, to be divested from everything that gets in my way, to be fully one, fully whole, to be fully there with God, the God that loved me through it all. Oh, to be swallowed up by life. There is no earthly information I have to give that will provide you or the family all that much comfort this day, but there's a spiritual truth that may in some way suffice it, and it is this. 
If anybody asks you what happened to Jim, you tell them he was swallowed up by life. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to give honor to our God, thank him for allowing our feet to hit the ground this morning and to come in here and to celebrate a life well lived. And I just told Tish, thanking her for having me follow uh, Brother Wilson. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a pastor. Um, I am a, a, a total believer uh, in Christ. Um, I'm going to probably break protocol and talk a little bit more about family remembrances. Uh, Jimmy uh, was a first cousin uh, to me. Um, the initial program had me in there as special cousin. Um, I laughed and I liked that because Jimmy would have said, yeah, you're special, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Short bus and a silver helmet kind of special. Um, <laughs> if you knew Jimmy, um, and I called him Uncle Jimmy to remind him how much older he was than me. <laughs> and he called me nephew. And like Mo, uh, has mentored me over the years, has been instrumental in my growth and my walk with Christ. Um, I, 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 I came to know Jimmy, gosh, the summers we would come down to Nashville and visit with family. Uh, Aunt Helen, Uncle Jimmy, uh, Constance Tara, and Dwight, and Jimmy. Jimmy was a little older, but Jimmy was the cool guy with the big fro, and the Fu Manchu, and the dark glasses. And, was, and just, I, I always looked at him and looked at him like he was Muhammad Ali. He, he was, just, was just so glib, you know, he just so slick, so smooth. I became, I idolized him, and I, I adopted him as an older brother. I'm an only child, and I just decided I'm gonna adopt him. He's gonna be my older brother. And that's how we grew over the years, 50 plus years of knowing Jimmy. And so we went through many cycles and many seasons of life. Um, some of you know Jimmy's battled many, many health issues, uh, battled and, and beat cancer. Uh, obviously, uh, some of the more, more, more recent issues in terms of his kidneys and diabetes. Um, I always marveled never hearing him ask, why me? Never asked that question. Always talked about how to get better, how to live better, how to get closer to Christ. That was something that was just amazing to me. The heart of a man that, that has that perspective in the face of all kinds of things that could have caused business, bitterness, that could have caused doubt. It just reinforced his faith. Fast forward later in life, our relationship, our bond became even closer. It started out, um, we got close, I don't know, it was just kind of a natural, a natural uh, uh, connection there. Uh, we were both, we are both, we were both very sarcastic. As you're, as you're saying, what happened to him, uh, as Liz said yesterday, and I've heard him say many, many times, probably his heart stopped. That's funny. <clears throat> it's okay, it's okay. He, he's in there laughing, he's in there laughing. The heart stopped, that's probably what did it. That's just the way Jimmy thought about things, right? And, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's coming from the right place. And it's coming from a place of helping you feel better in a situation where your heart is broken, right? And he had that ability no matter what the situation was. Um, over 50 years, there was only, there's only been two instances where he and I had a little bit of a disagreement. And one of them was a huge disagreement. I'm gonna share that with you. The other one I won't tell you. That disagreement was over him having this idea that I should not get tested to see if I could be a donor when he needed a kidney transplant. I ultimately had to go to Liz to get the information. That's the only time he and I almost fell out. And, and his reasoning, which was just, just mind-boggling to me, was because he was concerned about me. He didn't want to put me in harm's way. Well, my response is, this ain't your decision, this is God's decision. And God decided it's a perfect match. And God decided the surgery is gonna be perfect. 
God told me, name that kidney you're going to give him, Levi, in honor of our grandfather. <laughs> I did. And when that kidney went into Jimmy, the surgeon came back. I heard. I was kind of out of it. But the surgeon came back and told us that kidney was producing off the charts immediately. That kidney was anointed. It was intended to be in Jimmy. So our bond was a, is a blood bond, an absolute blood bond. That caused our relationship to go to the next level, all around the glory and the grace and the mercy of Christ. Hearing this news, I cannot, I still haven't gotten in my head how this news has impacted me because seeing Jimmy all the way back in New Jersey when he was fighting cancer, seeing him come through all of this. I don't know how many of you saw him when he was at his sickest, and I don't know how many of you even knew how sick he was because he was still going to work. He was still doing everything. And you may not have even known that. If you visited the house, it looked like a hospital ward. And he was soldiering it on because he had faith and he had belief and he had strength to do that. Through all of that, the thing that drew us more close than donating a kidney, more close, close than dueling over sarcasm, more close than anything else is a love for Christ. And I know Jimmy, regardless, good, bad, or other, that was something that absolutely never wavered. And so the comfort we have to take, not knowing, we all know we're going to be in the same situation. We don't know when and we don't know why. The comfort we take is knowing we do know where he is. The humor I take in this is I can't wait to talk about how surprised he was after taking a nap and waking up on a golf course with Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that mind blowing? Isn't God good? Isn't God good? I want to thank each and every one of you, um, family, believers, co-workers, uh, for your support, for your love. This man loved you back. Um, we will see him again. And our entire family thanks you very much for your, for your prayers and your support. God bless you. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away, fly away.
Can you join me in putting our hands together for the fact that Jesus wins? Amen. <clears throat> this is not the end of our story. Uh, to me, he was Jim. He's a man with many names. Jim was a, a chief jailer whose job was to run prisons and jails. He knew about systems. He knew about institutions. Now, Jim's job was not to determine who was in the system or who wasn't in the system or it, he wasn't the judge who decided if people were innocent or guilty. His job was, and he believed his calling in life was, if you were in the system, if you were part of that institution, no matter if you were at the top or at the bottom, his job was to try to create a system and fill a system with dignity and fairness. And for all those of you here who, uh, who worked alongside of him or for him, you know how that was true. He had a job that often caused a lot of stress and tension. He had to make a lot of tough decisions. Uh, David Jordan, who's here today, a, a director of Agape here in town, myself and Jim began meeting about two years ago every Thursday in a discipleship time in which some days we would talk about fishing and golf and about the city of Memphis, about uh, race, and the list goes on. It was just a time for us to come together and seek the Lord. Thursday before he died, I brought before them, David and Jim, and I said, guys, look, this summer I have a sabbatical coming up. The elders have given me uh, just over a month to go and just seek the Lord and find rest, so I need you to speak some advice into my life. So both of you have probably taken sabbaticals before at some point, right? Because all three of us, we love our jobs. We love to work. It brings us to life. We find passion in it. And David wasn't any help because David said, no, I've never had one. And Jim wasn't any help because Jim said, I've never had one either. <laughs> and then Jim came back later on that morning. And he said, you know what? I guess I have had a sabbatical. And it's not one that I chose, but the last 12 months of my life have been like a sabbatical. And four of those 12 months have been really good. And we went on to talk about the pace of life and the rhythm of life and having some balance. Because I know the job Jim had as a jailer. There were nights when he did have the call of someone who committed suicide. There were nights he had the call of people who escaped. There were nights when he, he knew that there were lawsuits on its way and tough decisions he had to make. And in some ways, because of the bondage, that we are in here on this earth, Jim was held in bondage too. Yet last Sunday, he sat down in a recliner to take a nap, but when he opened his eyes, it wasn't Liz's beautiful face that he saw, though I'm, I know he loved waking up to naps and see you. When he woke up from this nap, he was seeing the face of God, the King of glory. He woke up in glory. He sat down doing what he loves to do a Sunday afternoon, taking a nap, watching sports on the TV, right? And he woke up in glory. And in some ways, I just celebrate today, on last Sunday, the jailer was set free. Oh, the jailer was set free. The jailer was liberated. The jailer never has to experience any form of bondage again. And the freedom he wanted to pour into other people, he has now experienced in its fullness. He's set free. There was another jailer you read about in Scripture in Acts chapter 16. And he ran an institution. He ran a jail cell. And, and for this guy, I mean, he, he ran his business so, I mean, to the point where when he thought people had escaped, he was about to kill himself. Mm -hmm. And this jailer, when he experienced this, what he knew was a miracle of God. And when he knew he was in the presence of greatness and that something miraculous was happening and that this God he heard about these people singing in the jail, the God he heard them singing about was on the move, what he says in that story is somebody needs to turn the lights on. He commanded for the lights to be turned on. Now, it wasn't a switch, right? He's commanding for torches. Somebody light some candles because not only did he need a light in that darkness, there was lights coming on in his heart. And there's some truths that I've gone back now over the past week in Acts 16 that when that jailer experienced the, the power of God, before he even surrendered his life to Christ, before he was baptized, he took time to wash the wounds of the inmate. And after washing the wounds of those who had been in his jail, he surrendered his life to Jesus as, long as, as well as his whole family. And then he made a meal for these people. 
You see, in just a few moments, what that jailer did in Acts 16, having experienced the power of God, having tended to the wounds of other people, and then having ex- uh, extended hospitality to th- those in his midst, he did this in just a few minutes, what Jim Coleman did in a lifetime. He was a man who had been touched by God, who cared about the wounds of other people, that they would be healed. And he, just anywhere he went, it was like he was just serving up a table. He just had the presence of hospitality in him. Uh, Jim, to all of us here, was a family member. He was a friend. He was a mentor. He was the light of God. I can't help but think, as somebody shot me a message earlier this week, what does his welcoming committee look like? Mm -hmm. And I don't know how all this goes down when we breathe our last breath. I know we are released from pain and from anything that Satan can do for us. And I don't know how it all goes down, but... I believe when he breathed his last breath, the king of glory began walking towards him. And the king of glory spoke the only well done that matters. Because I don't know about you, I live for a lot of other well dones. I like when people give me well dones to my face. I like when people give me well dones on social media and all other well dones. I like them. There's only one well done that matters. And I can't help but think if Jesus had other people who joined him for this welcoming committee. And that all around Jesus were former inmates and former employees who welcomed Jim by saying, because of you, I am here. Because of what God did in you. And you created a system where Jesus just flowed from your body and your life. I'm here. He cared about freedom, liberation, deliverance, salvation, restoration. There were times when being the jailer got the best of him. There were times when it became maybe too much of a job, where it almost became like an idol. But when Jim was at his best, and most of the time he was, being a chief jailer was how God wanted him to live out his faith. It was his vocation, it was his calling, and he was so good at it. And he wasn't a jailer who just happened to know some things about God. He knew God, which had an impact on how he ran systems and institutions and how he lived. Uh, I came here in 2008. After being here about two months, I, uh, I called up Jim. I said, man, I, I want to come to your space. I want to walk your turf. And show me what you do day in and day out. So I went down there and I walked in. 201 Poplar, and I said, man, are we eating lunch here today? And he said, if it's good enough for the inmates, it's good enough for me. And then he grinned, and he said, but next time we're going to Cozy Corner. (laughs) 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 And then we took time, and uh, he said, I want you to walk with me. And we walked every hallway in 201. The first person we came to, he stopped in the hallway, and he grabbed this person by the shoulders. He said, man, I know a hurricane's about to hit down on the coast. You have relatives down there, right? And the person said, yeah, I do. They're trying to get away and they're coming up here. And Jim said, do you have, do you have enough blankets for them? And the person said, I don't think we do. And Jim said, well, by tomorrow, I have four sleeping bags at your house. And I sat there thinking, man, this guy set this thing up, right? He's trying to impress his preacher. <laughs> <clears throat> And then the next person we came to, Jim stopped that person and said, I am so sorry to hear about the passing of your grandmother. And everyone we came to, he knew names and he knew stories. And even engaging in conversation with inmates, the presence of his body was just extending hospitality and grace everywhere we went. I go down to 201 Poplar today, and he hadn't been there in, I think, four years. And if I, you know, there are times where we're in a faith tradition where I don't have an ordination card. All I have is business cards. You have to visit some people on pastoral visits down at 201. When it's not visiting times, you have to have an ordination card. And I don't have one. So I just say Jim Coleman's name. <laughs> and when I mention his name, it's like they roll out the red carpet for me. They take me to places I don't even want to go. <laughs> and sometimes I'm like, how far will this influence take me? Can I, can I go to Ruth's Chris? I know Jim Coleman, all right? What's that going to get me today, man? Down at the forum, I know Coleman. <laughs> so I want anybody down there, I can mention his name and their face change. I'm no longer just, just a person. I'm somebody who knew Jesus. I've seen Jim cry a few times. 
And a couple of times I've seen him cry or when he has teenagers who've been sentenced to life without parole. And one day in tears, he told me about a 16-year-old boy who had just been sentenced to life without parole, and Jim cut that kid's hair. He's the boss, yet he's going in places, and he's cutting hair of teenage boys, trying to inject something good, something of Christ into them. Uh, we were walking a hallway at 201 Poplar, and he stopped me, and he said, Josh, sometimes I don't feel like I'm able to be a good elder at Sycamore View because this is my flock. A thousand employees, 3,000 inmates. He said, this is my flock. Um, see, there's something about when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, you become a light to the world. And for Jim, the Holy Spirit was living inside of him, and he was this light into our lives. He was this light to the world. Liz, he loved you. Almost every week for three years, I've spent at least an hour with him. And I can't remember him saying anything negative about you. Um, and how you have extended grace and forgiveness into his life. All of us here have been recipients of that. Because the grace and mercy and forgiveness he pours into us, we help learn from you. Your marriage is a witness to the goodness of God. Keisha, happy 34th birthday today. <laughs> I'm six months older than you. So if you need any advice on life, on driving, you can talk to me. I've experienced more than you. Your dad loved you so much. You just, anytime we would talk about you, his face would light up. And let me tell you, especially the last few years, as your cravings for God have increased, not that they weren't there prior to that, but the last few years as you've been chasing after the heart of God, deepening your own faith, <laughs> you made your dad so proud. I've heard names of Many of the relatives who are here, I'm putting faces to names today. I knew he was a great family man. To see all of you stand earlier, people who have worked with him, the impact. I don't know about you, I mean, I am a, I am a better man because of him. We are a healthier church. We're a stronger city because of his witness in this world. He was a great friend. Jim and I had a lot of meals together. Um... And something about eating meals, we were either, either at Captain D's or we were at restaurants with bars on the windows. <laughs> <laughs> and I laughed this past week because almost every meal Jim and I would have together, we would pray. Yet the food we were praying over was going to take a miracle from God for it to nourish our bodies. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> There are always hush puppies and french fries and <laughs> all the crunchies from Captain D's. I could just see the angels looking up at God saying, can you make that into something that can nourish their bodies? <laughs> like, God, you are good. <laughs> we ate a lot of meals. I stood on this stage almost two weeks ago on the five-year anniversary of my sister passing. And I looked out where you guys always sit, and I even spoke to Jim in that sermon, because that day when I got the phone call that they were calling the family in and my sister wasn't going to make it, I was beating Jim at Captain D's. <laughs> and we sat there for two hours. I know he had meetings to go to and appointments and other things, but it was like I was the only thing in his life that mattered that day. And I don't remember hardly anything he said. I don't remember much. I don't remember anything he said. He stayed there for two hours, and he just loved me. He was with me. As I said, I've been in a discipleship group with him for a few years. And there have been times in that group, or times when Jim and I have sat down to eat lunch, that I'll, I'll say, man, you won't believe what somebody said about me this past week. Or some email I received, and Jim just had this way. He did, I'm awful at impersonating people, but he had this little shuffle he would do. 
we would kind of just barely go back and forth, all right? Like he was situating himself <laughs> to speak words of wisdom, all right? And he did the little Jim Coleman shuffle, and his hands would come up on his lap. And he would say, it's okay. And the first time he said, it's okay, I wanted to punch him in his throat, all right? <laughs> I'm like, man, it's not okay. He would say, it's okay. Josh, you can cling, you can choose today to cling to something other than hope. But we cling to hope, and I'll never forget, I even went back in my phone two years ago when he spoke this line over me, and he said, Josh, hopeless people are the most dangerous people in the world because they don't have anything to live for. Wow. But those of us who have hope, don't allow anything else that comes around us to hold us down or bring us down or to pull us under. We're moving forward with hope. And for him, the reason he could say, it's okay, so you choose to cling to hope, the reason he, he believed this is because people were more than projects to him. People were more than objects. They had dignity. They had worth. To those of the Sycamore View Church, Jim loved this church. And the way he would kin to the hearts of people in the Sunday morning class where he would teach and the way he would walk these aisles and tend to people Sunday mornings and even on Wednesday nights. He loved you. <clears throat> when I came here seven years ago, I remember sitting with him talking about how some of the ways this church wanted to look more like Memphis. We want to reflect whatever our neighborhood looks like in color, economics, that we want to be a melting pot where people can come together from all different walks of life because if heaven's going to look like that, why don't we start practicing that, right? Yeah. And he said, Josh, yeah, we want Memphis. We want to look like Memphis, but we also want Memphis to look like us yeah. in our pursuit of righteousness and holiness. I love watching him on a journey in his own faith of learning and becoming so convicted that church is so much more than trying to be nice to people on a Sunday morning. And the church is so much more than trying to get the formula right. It's about being captured by the mission of God. So today, uh, we grieve hard because we love hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you don't want to go through life ever grieving again, just don't love. Oh. But it's going to make you miserable. Mm -hmm. Philip Yancey once wrote a story where he said uh, when Saint, uh, Mount St. Saint Helens erupted years ago, uh, left with it just this thick mantle of ash and these environmentalists came along because they did not know how do we even project how many wild, how much li wildlife was lost and then months went by and just out of nowhere out of the ground there would be these patches of wildflowers that would appear and they would appear in the shape of elk or moose or other wildlife and what they began to realize is that where things had died, now life was coming from that place. Wow. So it gave them a way to now count how much they had lost. And Jim followed so closely in the way of God. Right, The one who taught us that we lay down our lives so that other people can have life. And what they discovered at South Main Helens is something Jim's been living out for years and decades because it's what he has seen and the one he is following in Jesus that we don't lay down our lives, right? So the life can spread. Yeah. And life can move. And that we can be givers of life. So today, we, we mourn, but we also rejoice because the tomb is empty. Yeah. And though Jesus was carried into that tomb, he was not carried out. He walked out. Mm -hmm. And we give out a hallelujah today because death is beaten. Death is on a short leash. And the day is on its way when death itself is going to die. And it will be no more. We rejoiced that last Sunday, every longing that Jim had ever had was met when he entered into glory. And the one who burst out of the tomb is the one who walked toward him and the one who wants to walk towards you and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Can we stand together today? And I want to invite you right now as we pray for you to close your eyes. Will you bow your heads? If you were comfortable, I 
invite you and give you permission if you want to lift your hands, if you want to raise your hands in victory. Because today, God, in the presence of people that we don't know, but people who love Jim and people who stand on the promises of God, we declare today in the presence of good and evil that Jesus wins, that yes. death does not win, death doesn't get the last word. Yes. And God, we want to choose this day to cling to the hope that comes from heaven, mm -hmm. that declares that we are victorious. Mm -hmm. And I know Jim would want to pronounce from this stage today that we do not go forward from this day living in defeat. Yes. We are those who experience a victory in Jesus. Yes. And it's something that we wait for and hope for. It's also something we work towards and something we embrace right now. So God, for, may, the, may the victory and the promises of victory enter into us today. God, for the lives Jim has touched, for the life he lived. We mourn today, yet we are grateful that in your word it, it declares to us that you are a tear-wiping God. You oh, wipe yes. the tears from faces. You, and we ask for you to be that in the days to come. Yes. God, I ask specifically right now for Liz and for Tisha and for the family and close friends that, God, um, will you surround them with an awareness of your abiding presence? Yes. And for church, for those of you who are here today, if you will, will you just extend a hand towards Liz and Tisha right now? Just extend a hand in prayer. Because, God, we are asking right now for an anointing of God to come upon them, that when they go to bed tonight, at night, when they wake up in the morning, when they go throughout the day, that they will be overcome with an awareness of your abiding presence, that you do not leave them alone. And, God, that when they mourn, that they will be people who will mourn with hope. God, and if it is a feeling that you send up and down their spine, mm -hmm. or some way you present yourself to the left and to the right, but they know you're the God who walks with them each day. And God, we are grateful this day that the day is coming when every injustice is going to bow down to the name of Jesus. And that we get a stand today in victory. Because of you, it's for your glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you to stand again to kind of help me through this prayer. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Most gracious Father, Lord, Almighty, we want to thank you for this day, Lord, a day which you did not have to allow any of us to be able to see on this day, but by your grace and mercy, you saw fit to us to be able to make it here to this building, Lord, to celebrate a home going of our dear brother, father, uncle, cousin, whatever he may be, friend, home going, Lord, and the day that you have taken, taken him out of his pain, out of his agony, out of his stress, out of all things that ail this physical body, Lord, we, those that many of us here are, are suffering on a daily basis, Lord, we know he no longer suffers those pains, Lord. We ask you to be with those that he has touched throughout his life, Lord, whether it be family, co-workers, those who may not agree with things he stood on, but see now why he stood on what he stood on, and that he was only trying to help them throughout this life, this physical life, this spiritual life, Lord. We want to thank you for this church here at Sycamore. Thank you for them embracing uh, my uncle. Um, we want to thank you for the impact that they had on him, and also for the love he showed to them, Lord. We, we thank you for allowing, allowing my uncle to be able to join his father, his mother, Lazarus, as they, they wait on us to join them, Lord, and as they wait on your son to come back take us all if we live faithful unto you, Lord. We ask to be with Liz and Leticia as they go day by day mm -hmm. um, living without a loved one, living without somebody that they have, have grown to love over the years, have, have grown to be accustomed to being around, Lord. We ask you to be with them as they abide in the house that he will no longer physically be in, but Lord, we know spiritually he will always be there. We ask you to be with his family, his, his brothers, his sisters, his um, cousins, all those who are his family and friends as we leave this building, Lord, but we 
don't leave his love behind. Mm. And they, this day not only just brings us together on this occasion, Lord, but it brings us together as a family, as a friend, as a, as a church, as a, as a world, as a neighborhood, to grow closer, Lord, to you, to grow closer as a physical family and spiritual family, Lord. We ask you that if there's anyone here, Lord, who does not know you, that he has maybe influenced, he has taught, his, taught your word too, that they will be pricked in their heart, Lord, and one day come to you, Lord. We ask you to, well, we th want to thank you for um, the sun that you allow to shine today, Lord, to clear these roads for us on this day, Lord. Thank we you. thank you for those who have traveled miles and hours away to be, able to be here to celebrate this home going, Lord. We, we know that there could have been places they had, may have could have been, Lord, but we know that they allowed the space and time to be able to celebrate this home going, to pay the respects to his family, Lord. Be with those um, who may take this occasion as, as sadder than maybe what it, what it should be, Lord. We ask you that they remember the, the smiles, the, the jokes, the laughs that they share with him more than maybe the frowns he may have gone through, Lord. We ask you that we, this day on, we remember the happy things that he has instilled in us, Lord. We, we thank you for you shining through my uncle, shining through Jimmy Coleman. Mm -hmm. We ask you to be with, um, once again, be with Liz and Leticia, Lord, as we, we know that this it's a burden on them, Lord, but we know that they're two strong women. They have displayed that on this day, Lord, with their, with their smiles, with their moving around this building, that we know that they won't fall short of your word, Lord. We know that they will stand strong in your word because that's what their husband, their father, want them to do, Lord. Be with us as we depart from this building, Lord, and most gracious Father, till we meet again. Christ, we do pray. Amen. Amen. trade my earthly home for a better one bright and fair Christ left to prepare a mansion for his children in the air I'll join him in that land where tears no sorrows can be found Oh, I want a crown. There's always a crown. Let me, let me your throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion. Robe and crown. The weather there, the sun shines day and night. No cold or no rain will fall today, for the sun shines ever bright. I'll need no heavy garment, I'll wrap my robe around. When I receive my mansion, robe and crown, mansion, robe and a crown. Let me, let me all throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion, robe and crown. My head is bowed. But one day, I'll wear a smile. Receive my mansion, robe and crown, mansion, robe and a crown. Yeah, love will always abound. Let me, let me all throne surround. Lord, please reserve my mansion, robe and crown. Let me, let me your throne surround. 
Lord, please reserve my mansion. I want a mansion. Lord, please reserve my mansion. I want a mansion. Lord, please reserve my mansion. I want a mansion. Then cry. 